On the road to 50, she assisted countless students in achieving their tertiary education. First, a nurse and then an educator. This humble girl from Andros went on to become the first female to hold the office of Deputy Prime Minister. She is Cynthia Mother Pratt. As the country prepares to celebrate its 50th anniversary of independence, the patriotic masses swing into full celebratory mode on every inhabited island in our archipelago. It's important for all of us to know the story of this road to 50, so tonight we continue our discussion on 50 years of independence, this time with Cynthia Mother Pratt. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. We'll see you on the other side of this break. You're watching On The Record and we are discussing 50 years of independence with none other than Cynthia Mother Pratt. Welcome back to On The Record. Always delighted to have you on the show. You know, I'm not supposed to say that I have favorite guests, but you certainly <laughs> are among my favorite guests. Always good to have you here. How have you been? Doing very well. You very look well, fantastic. Thank I you love so your much. outfit. You Thank absolutely you. look amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to jump <laughs> jump right into it. We have been independent yes. since 1973. Mm -hmm. We're going to start with some of your overall thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, of what does it mean for us to be independent? Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on our independence mm -hmm. and who we are. Mm -hmm. Jerome, let me... First, thank you for having me here this morning. And I was delighted to know that I would be sitting with my son again. People go, ask, well, I don't know, but thank you. Yes. Thank you. You know, Jerome, it's good to know that we are able to handle our own affairs. We have the capability as a nation to handle our affairs. And so I think independence means that we have graduated to another level, whereby we don't have to be dictated to another country. We can make decisions on our own. That's what it means to me. Do you think the generations of Bahamians who did not mm -hmm. uh, come through that British rule or who were not around mm -hmm. when independent, do you think they really understand what it means for us to be sovereign and to make our own decisions mm -hmm. and why that's so important? Mm -hmm. Do you think the, the generations get it? I don't, I don't think we talk about it enough, I'd put it that way, Jerome, because there are many things that I believe we should stress as Bahamians who live here. We're a part of the soil, and sometimes we tend to shy away from talking about what is best for our country. And so if they don't know, I guess they can't talk. But if we continue to talk about those of us who've been here before them, because right now we have a lot of students who are brighter minds, we call them at the University of the Bahamas, who don't know who even wrote the pledge. And, and, and because the question was asked, who wrote the pledge? Who did the national anthem? And Philip Bramming, Dr. Philip Bramming was standing right there. And they said all of them are deceased. You, you see? And, and so he, they didn't know that he was one of those who he was the writer of the, of the pledge. And so I'm saying, Jerome, in our country, the Bahamas, our country, you notice I said our country. Mm -hmm. We have much to 
to be proud of. Much to be proud of. We have brilliant minds. We have creative people. But our younger persons, we are not letting them understand what this country is about and where it came from. Because what they see is now. They don't know who was there before because they feel as though it's always been this way. No, it wasn't always this way. And so when we see younger leaders, I'm happy to see how many of our younger people are becoming involved in leadership. Mm -hmm. It tells you we have to start building from somewhere. And it, we have to recognize those forefathers and mothers who have caused this to be realized. And I think because I have been around, I've seen changes. One of the things that I'm concerned with is family because that's where there's a breakdown. And so getting back to your question, if we are talking about it enough to our younger people, I think we need to talk more because we're not talking enough. That's a very good point. Would you say that we are well accomplished as a nation? And if so, why? I think in every nation, there's always room for improvement. I, be, I believe we've come a long way, very long way. And let me begin by looking at education. Mm -hmm. hey. During my time, Jerome, you weren't even born, all right? Our schools, we went so far to the age of 14. If your parents didn't have money, you had to go out and seek employment. At That's 14. male and female, yes, sir. I knew in Woodcock Primary, that's where I attended. That was one big hall where we were divided by barriers, you know, cardboard barriers. Class over there, class here, class. And so you had to be attentive because, you know, noise would be in there from mm -hmm. the other class, but there was nowhere else to go. And so Ms. Mabel Walker at that time, Ms. Walker was alive and she was the principal. Even the school, the, the Woodcock Primary, even though I was a student there, we never knew Woodcock Primary. We called it Ms. Walker's school. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, even though you were a student there right. as a youngster. And then, of course, you go on to Western Junior, Western Senior. And so I'm looking at the system at that time compared to today. I know one of the, um, one of the mandates of that first PLP government in the, in the 60s when they took over in 67 and even moving towards independence in yes. 73 was to bring education Absolutely. to all Bahamians and that even included the march towards tertiary, tertiary education. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to get to that point. Mm -hmm. That's why I started early because when the PLP government took over at that time, of course, we are young, we don't know, PLP, whatever, we just got out there with doing our thing at the rally time because they didn't have that much like they do today. Mm -hmm. And so what had happened is when the PLP took over and then the pr promise was to improve education, to make a difference, so that the ordinary child will have the same opportunity than the child that was afforded, the parents were afford to pay for them. And that's when the public high schools came on stream. The senior highs and then of course, because at that time it was just Western Senior, Western Junior, and Eastern Senior. And then of course, when you got, when you finish high school, you couldn't go on to senior high, we call it. We used to call it junior high, senior high, and then on. So if your parents couldn't afford it, then of course you went out and looked for employment. What did the access to education do? What did you see happening as more and more Bahamians 
and Bahamians who look like you and I mm -hmm. were able to go on to receive mm -hmm. full high school education. What did you see from your perspective start to happen? Today, today, Jerome, many of the young people at my, my age are leaders. They end up being leaders and helping to lead this country in one way or another. And they all came through the public school system. Many of our teachers came through the public school system and they were excellent teachers that worked feverishly with our children. Because of course back then, you know, you didn't have that much problems within the schools because teachers were leaders in every respect. In other words, they were like parents. You fed them so much, you <laughs> dare not do anything out of the way because parents gave them access to punish you if they wanted to. Of course, you couldn't go home and say that <laughs> because they'll get another That's one. That's another punishment. Y yes, <laughs> you see? And so, so the, what I'm saying is based on the public school system, the kind of students they produce, some of the leading doctors in the world came from the public school system out of the Bahamas. I don't want to go on and call names, mm -hmm. but I'm just showing you that that's the progress that was made. So in the, our system, the system worked. It worked absolutely, absolutely. Now the thing about it is, remember when COB came on the mm -hmm. on stream, there was a joke about it. Um, high school students are better than COB. I can remember it. I'll never forget those words. Wow. The criticism that came at COB. But it was the same criticism that came as the Defense Force. <laughs> because they'd say, well, you know, who, who, who are they going to defend? Because, you know, it was just a handful. Mm -hmm. But we had to start somewhere, Jerome. And they started COB, and gradually it started to improve. An amalgamation uh, of teachers' college, and there was uh, even so a tactical school, so all these amalgamated yes. to form... The College of the Bahamas, again, I think it was in the early 70s, 74. The, yes. Yeah, 75 is when it actually And started. then BTVI, don't forget, uh, yes. that came on later. Right. You see? And so you can go and learn a skill, and it was open, and it was free. Over the past 50 years, in which period do you feel our government was um, at its most positive peak? Which, between, from 1973 to now, when do you think really our country was at its best in terms of governance and having a good government? Well, it's difficult for me to say because it's, it's been a long stretch between mm -hmm. things. But I think um, during an era where Selinden had led the country at that time, because, you know, he was there for 25 years. And so most of these things were laid under his watch. And um, he was instrumental in making things happen at that time for Bahamians. And of course, you would have remembered when A.D. Hanna came up with Bahamianization, mm -hmm. making sure that Bahamians were first in everything. And, and so I think that that period is what really cemented a lot of things because Bahamians then realized that I have first preference in my country. For those who don't know and don't understand the context, mm -hmm. why was it important for A.D. Hanna to come up with that Bahamianization policy? Why was it important for the government to um, insist on Bahamians first? The reason for that, Jerome, is that, first of all, many foreigners were coming in fully qualified. Some weren't qualified, but they had connections. So they were getting employment making this, doing the same type of work, but they were getting more salary than the Bahamian. And then, of course, you found that the Bahamians were like second-class citizens in their country. And so we had to make, the government at that time, had to make it clear that if an opening is there on a job that Bahamians can hold on or they can do, you're the higher Bahamians first. Other than that, if you couldn't find a Bahamian, then 
there was access to bring in the foreigner. And, and from what you know, I've been able to understand, even in my own research, that in order to have Bahamians qualify, mm -hmm. there was this emphasis on education. Absolutely. And even the College of the Bahamas at that time to make sure that our people were ready to take those jobs. Yes, yes, because before we did not have the opportunity because it wasn't there to learn. The skill wasn't there. We had to bring people in who could teach us whether it's a skill or whether, in fact, you're talking about academics or in business or whatever area. And so they started bringing in qualified people to teach Bahamians, but we had to make certain that they were only here for a period of time. Once Bahamians became qualified, then they had to leave. In addition to building the educational foundation uh, locally, mm -hmm. I know that the government at the time also put a great emphasis on ensuring that Bahamians had an opportunity to go abroad yes. for tertiary education yes. that they just could not get here. Right. And how did that impact our development? Well, I think, I think what has happened too is that many of our leaders, um, some of them went to different universities and things abroad, so they made connections for other Bahamians to follow in their footsteps. And I think the church had a lot to do with that, mm. okay? And that was uh, um, the Baptist church with Reverend Ari Cooper and those who really um, secured a number of scholarships at Jordan Princeville, not Jordan Princeville, um, Florida Memorial. Because my brother Charles went there, I think Sharon Wilson went there, who is now a KC. And a number of Bahamians came through there, and that, that was because of connections from Bahamians and the institution. You mentioned something that just stuck out to me, and that is the role of the church. Mm -hmm. And in those days, church and state worked very closely oh, together. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There's no question about it. But you see, Jerome, that is where it all begins. Because we've been a successful people is because... The church was an integral part of life for Bahamians. And so we fed God, period. And the church was, it was like ordinary, but it wasn't ordinary because you set out your calendar and Sunday was included in your calendar. So church was Sunday whether you were on Saturday or Sunday, but you were going to church that weekend. All the other days, you would do whatever you have to do your chores. But I'm saying that when the church started, when we did, well, we respected the church, you notice know, things started to go downhill because we put God on the back burner. And that brings me to my next question. Mm -hmm. That what seems to be that departure um, from the church and even those Christian values. Mm -hmm. How do you see that mm -hmm. impacting the, the, the decay, the moral mm -hmm. decay, the social decay mm -hmm. of our country? <clears throat> it all begins with the family, Jerome. It all begins with the family. God was at first and foremost in families back then. When mama said something, that's what it was. When dad said something, that's what it was. But when it came to church, it was not up for debate. You were going, and you were going every day, if you had to go every day. The and, family and three times on Sunday. Yes, sir. <laughs> and you went to whatever church was open, mm -hmm. you, you see. And, and the thing is, because the family was so cemented with God, children had respect because they were trained in the proper way. Because the family is corroded today, that's why we have so much problems. Because the home itself, it's a house now, it's not a home, which is a major difference. And so my point is, until Jerome, we go back to God. If we get the family back where it's supposed to be under God, we will see changes. It will come. And so our young men would know what it is to respect young ladies. Our young ladies would know how to conduct themselves 
We're, we're just about to, out of time in this segment, but before we okay. go to the break, I've got to ask you this. How much of our departure from church and Christianity, or I won't even just say Christianity, but mm -hmm. our departure from church, mm -hmm. how much of that do you think was tied to our success? Because I always have a theory that, you know, we, we were doing so well at, 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 at a point in our lives, it seemed as if we sort of threw caution to the wind. How much of that do you think is tied to our success? I know everything is tied to it because you reverence God first in everything. You reverence God first, and he promised he would bless. He would bless your land. The nation that forgets God will all be turned into hell. That's the word of God, Jerome. You think we're in the forgetting stage? Well, we're almost there in some families. In some families, we've gone to the place where, but Jerome, we don't have enough time to go into this path. But when I, I brought in what we call urban renewal, I mean, after school, back to school, the suspension program, mm -hmm. school suspension program, I found out that many of those boys who were suspended, they've never been christened, they've never been in a church. These are teenage boys around 14, 15. Never been in a church? Never been in a church. So you wonder why we're the way we are? It's because mama don't go, dad doesn't go, children doesn't go. Well, the part we are at the point of a, a break, you know, we could just talk and talk and talk. Yes. Well, we've got to take yes, our sir. first break. Mm -hmm. uh, when we return, 50 years of independence. Stay close. Welcome back, you're watching On The Record, and we're discussing 50 years of independence with Cynthia Mother Pratt, formerly Deputy Prime Minister in the Christie administ Administration. Mother Pratt, we really spent a lot of time in that last segment talking about education, but I mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about your uh, background in education, mm -hmm. um, from a nurse to an educator. Mm -hmm. Well, Jerome, I knew I'd begin by saying I started out as a nurse, and this would be in 1961. I stayed at Princess Margaret Hospital until 78. And then, of course, I then decided my calling was really not in nursing. I wanted to reach more of the grassroots people couldn't do it in nursing. And I decided that I would go and speak with the minister, and God would have it that Perry Christie was the minister of health at the time. And I asked him whether he'd allow me to transfer to education, and he agreed. Now, when this happened, Jerome, I was transferred to C.C. Sweeting High School. But I did not have a, te a teacher's certificate or a, 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 my bachelor's. God sent Tom Grant to my house shortly after that. And he came to say that there's a school in North Carolina mm -hmm. that needed a volleyball coach, but they would also give a scholarship in order to pursue your degree while you are coaching. And of course, I agreed to go with much restraint from my husband, you know, he was, <laughs> he, <laughs> he wanted me to go now, and I'm the one who, who's really reluctant because I'm, you know, I'm married now. I'm married with, with kids. <laughs> with children. I can't just pull up and leave my 
children like that. And, and he said, you go, and I will take care of the children. And he did just that, as you know, Jerome. Mm -hmm. And once I would have gotten into education, that is where I was able to go into the highways and the byways and search for those underprivileged kids because most of them attended C.C. Sweeney. So this is the heart of the inner city. And so I was able to actually understand their plight, many of them why they were failing in school. Some of the young boys were, were working. They were helping mama with the rent. So they were just getting home at midnight because they were shelf boys and things like that in food stores. And so when they came to school... They were tired. Some of them were sleeping in class. Wow. And you would have thought that they, they probably were into something negative. No, these, these were working boys. And so we had to work we're trying to help them at that stage. And that is why I wanted to get in to the community. Not only did you work with those students at CC Sweeting, through your matriculation at St. Augustine's, which is now a university, yes. you were able to establish a relationship with that mm -hmm. uh, school to allow countless Bahamians, myself included, yes. Yes to receive tertiary education yes. who ordinarily may not have no. had even a glimmer no. of hope no. and not gotten the opportunity. No. no. Jerome, <clears throat> today, today I'm so proud to see what many of them have done and they returned home. That's the important part about it. They returned home and given a chance for employment and they are building this country today. But some of the stories are so amazing and we just don't have enough time to go through them. But the fact that the child, a child that I pulled out of a certain environment had no hope. And I'll always remember this mother when I came to her. She said, Mother Brad, where are you taking my daughter? So I said to her, I said, I have a scholarship for her. <laughs> and she, she said, um, there's no point. She right. said, because she has to come right back. So I said, give me a chance. Give me a chance with her. I said, when we get to that bridge, we'll cross it. We're really not there yet. She said, all right. And I took her. She graduated with honors. She was a, a student in the sciences. Mm. Today, she is in charge. I won't even say it because someone might read between the lines. But I'm showing you some of these, as you said, would have never had an opportunity to college. Never, because they didn't have the first penny. Some of them came with a suitcase and a clothes on, and the clothes on their back? Yes. I know that from personal experience, all no. to you. Is that work that you still do today? Do you still assist? Do you still have those connections? I still assist, but not the way I did, because I'm just, I just have a lot on my plate. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about it, Jerome, is that I'm still connected with the institution. And they would call from time to time, wanting, and then... Also, now I have many other institutions now, universities, that I've gotten connections with since that, and I'm able to help students in that regard. But, but the important thing, Jerome, is for us as a people, Bahamians I'm talking about, to know what it is to give back once you would have gotten an opportunity. You see, your give is, back did not just stop with helping to educate. No. You decided to enter politics. Yes. Why? Initially, I didn't think I was making the right decision initially because I've never been involved in politics. I've never been around it. I, I don't have a clue what it's all about. <laughs> My husband knew a lot more 
because he was more he was more interested in it. But working the fields, the communities, a people, there were persons watching that I didn't know was watching. You were well known. I didn't realize <laughs> it. You were very, very well known. <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't realize it until Sir Lyndon, at that time, was the prime minister, and he came to my house. He said that he wanted to have a conversation with my husband and I, and of course, it was it was a time when, I mean. Certainly, I, I, I had no interest at that time. And he told me that he, they were observing me and what I've done to help the Bahamian people. Now, Jerome, I'm thinking, well, maybe he just want me to help to do something, not, not to go into politics. And so he said, he, you know, we'd like to know if I were interested in running. So I said, running well. <laughs> Did it well? I mean... He said, representing the people. I said, in politics? He said, yes. I said, no, sir. So he said, something he said that caught my eyes, Jerome. He said, Mother Pratt, you've helped so many from this level. If you enter that level, how many more you can help? That caught my eyes, Jerome. I thought about it. So I said, I said, I need some time to think. He said, how much time? I said, six weeks. I figured if I said a long time, he won't return. He'd lose interest. Yes. <laughs> so, so six weeks, he was back on the day of six weeks. <laughs> he said, I'm back now. So I said, it's six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Already? <laughs> he said, yes. He said, yes, ma'am. And then my husband, you know, he wanted it from the beginning. He said, Cynthia, give it a try. Give it a try. And I said, well, I'll just do it once. Just once. But I don't know where to begin. I, I don't know how you set up a, an office. I don't know how. Because I, I knew nothing about it. He said, we'll do that for you. Just say yes. You hear me? All we want you to do is represent the people and the rest and is you history. Did. You did all the way up to the position of Deputy Prime Minister. Yes. And even an acting Prime Minister yes. at one point yes. during an illness of, yes. of, of Perry Christine. Yes. I know we've spoken about that previously, but before yes. we go to the break, I've got to ask you this. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of uh, talk about uh, what's next for you yes. and whether you're going uh, to Government Hill as we, as we uh, like to call it. Um, is there any truth to that? Jerome, I'd rather not comment at this time. Okay. Um, what I would say, though, is that as long as I can represent my people, serve my people, and know that I've done my best to make life better for someone, that's all that matters to me. And I believe in this country, we have good people. All they want is a chance. A chance. You know. Well, I, I respect that answer for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I will go out on a limb to say that your work is not done. And I know that there's more to do. I don't know where, but I know, I know that there is more to do. We're going to take our final break. We still have a lot more to talk about. Yeah. We still got some time to go. You're watching On The Record. Stay tuned. Fifty years of independence is our discussion tonight, and our guest is Cynthia Mother Pratt. Let's get right back into it now. So we are on the brink of celebrating fifty years of independence yes. as a society. In your opinion, have we evolved? I think we have. 
I think we have. I and think how we have. have we, we, we have much to be proud of. We have much when we look at the world, when we look at smaller countries. Jerome, I knew when the Bahamas was at the bottom of the Caribbean. Mm. I knew the days of the market when we would go down to the wharf where the boats came in. You weren't even born yet. When the Haitian sloops would come in, brought their big mangoes and, you know, the ones with little corroded, they throw in the water. That was a meal for us. We would be out on the dock with our little sticks hooking the mangoes out of the water. That's a meal. I'm talking about the Bahamas where we were at the bottom. And because we stayed committed to God as a Christian nation, God brought us to the top of the Caribbean, the Bahamas. I've witnessed it, and God allowed me to live, to witness, and I reminded my people from the parliament many times. It's documented on the hand side. I said, God elevated us to the top of the Caribbean, and don't ever forget because I knew when we were at the bottom. Wow. Well, that brings me naturally to my next question. Do you still recognize any of the traits of good manners, of village raising, our children, honesty, that were dominant in our society 50 years ago? Very little, very little as compared to where we came from, where we were. Because the days I grew up, do you know, Days I grew up, fathers were fathers, mothers were mothers. And what I mean by that is they worked as a team. Their children were children. The children were not your friends. They were your children. And so you had order in your household. You know what it was to have your chores taken care of. Parents did not play with their children in terms of them speaking to them like they, their company. No, no, that was saying no, no. Yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am. Those things never went away. They still should be, if it exists today, you would see the difference in attitude and behavioral patterns. But what has happened is that we have, as you know, children who are mothers, but I, I have to ask you this because a lot of times in this very same forum we talk about the disintegration of the family and the fact that there are a lot of single mm -hmm. mothers and raising kids on their own. But mm -hmm. this isn't a new phenomenon. Yes, People but, raise, women raise children on their own. The difference is back then you were an adult. That's the difference. Mm. The girls... Today are girls, they're not women, they're girls. You, you're talking about 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds, some younger, mm. who are mothers, you know? They, they don't even know how to pull their own clothes on straight yet. But they, they are mothers. And that's the sad part about it is, you realize today, Jerome, we have grandmothers who are in their 30s? Yes. As you said it just now, and I thought, oh, their grandmothers in 30s. In their grandmothers, that is the major difference. Back then, it was a no no. And you had many mothers back then who raised their children. Remember, dad went on the contract, you know. Mm -hmm. There was no father around many times. Mm -hmm. And the women managed the home, took care of the family and everything. They were both captains or out on Absolutely. the boat to see or other places there. They yes. weren't always in the home. Yes. But, but, but back then, the women knew about life. They know what it is to raise a family. They know how to cook. You have this young generation, many of them, they can't boil water. They'll <laughs> burn water. <laughs> you, you, you know, so you... you that's the, that's the difference. 
You're you, right. You see? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that is where we have fallen down the road. We have a big problem in our society as well major, with violence. Major. We are deemed a violent people in many instances because of the high rates of crime. Uh, what do you think is at the root of, of these issues that we have with crime? Um, and why can't it seem that we can no longer reason with each other? When it, somebody says something, it turns violent. I mean, even just driving sometimes, you see the, the hostility on the road. Jerome, we have to go back. We have to go back. I'm sorry, but without God, that's why you end up the way you end up. We, it all begins and ends with God, Jerome. Because when you are taught the word of God and when you know what the Bible says, because you got that teaching from a baby, you know what it is to be forgiven. You know what it is to forgive others. You know what it is to help. And if someone said something, you always get all bent out of shape about it. You know what it is to forget. I mean, let's, let's move on. And, and To love. And exactly. To love. Mm -hmm. you, you see? And so today, the anger and the bitterness is here because people don't want God. There's no buttering it up. You may as well get straight to the point. Until we go back to God, this is what will happen. Because if a young man don't know anything about God, he would rob you in broad daylight who, you, who you've just helped. And it doesn't mean anything to him, but he has a conscience. You would say, well, listen, you can't do that, such and such a thing, because you were taught from early in Sunday school, love your brothers as yourself, all these things you will learn. So if the child never been to church, mm. they don't go to church. You watch them, they use the day of worship for the beach, for the parties, the lack of respect for the church, they pass with the loud music, loud church music is going on. Middle of church on oh, Yes, yeah. sir. These yeah. are the things, you're godless. It all begins and ends with God. And I know many people don't want to hear this, but I will continue to stand on those words until we go back to God. We'd find that our children that would become manly, we'd know what it is to be forgiving, we'd know what it is to help your neighbor, we would know that because our conscience wouldn't allow us to pass and see an old lady on the street. You know, the other day, an old lady standing on the road selling her little water. You know, they stand in the, in the side of the street. And this guy ran from the back of, of Ridgeland Park area and hit her with a butt of something, knocked her down with her little soul and thing, and grabbed it and ran away. That's a no-no in the days when we grew up. You, you wouldn't even dream of attacking a woman, much less an older woman. That's the action of a heathen. No God in him. That's the point I'm making. Mm. You see? As we are on the subject of our society and country, do you think um, the conduct, or what do you think about the conduct of our parliamentarians in and out of parliament? Um, are they on the right track 50 years later? Well, we've had, um, we've had much growth over the many years, because you, you know, we've had many different parliamentarians come in. Mm -hmm. Some have been productive, some might not have been as productive. But as a member of parliament, when you're coming in for the first time, the thing about politics is nobody teaches you anything before you arrive. <laughs> you must remember that. You're coming in, you know nothing about nothing. And so you have to find your way. So in a case like that, you'll make mistakes. But the one thing is you don't repeat the mistake. You be a quick learner, but you don't make the same mistake twice. And that's when you start to learn and develop because you have no one to hold you by the hand and lead you because you are representing an area. The person who's holding your hand, they have a 
community as well, a constituency too, so they don't have time to hold your hand. So you have to learn and be a good listener, not only to the politicians, but to the people. Have, have, have governments been responsive enough to the needs of our people? I think in some cases, in some cases, there are different reasons, Jerome, that the government most of the time don't want to say, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Okay? They would rather take the abuse from the people. Well, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. But there's no money to do it with. But they don't want you to know that at the time. Because you must bear in mind that, that people vote for you. Voters vote. But they vote for you to be a representative. They didn't vote for you to be a minister. Mm. So you can't say, well, I, I have to go to this island. I have to go to that place. And they don't understand that. I want my representative. My role is but, the yeah. I need my <laughs> exactly. life. Yes, yeah. you see. But at the same time, they have to go abroad in order to get assistance to help you here. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to explain that to your people. Some listen, some don't want to listen. <laughs> you, <Yeah. laughs> you see? So it's not easy being a member of parliament. My life, I had no life, Jerome. I left in the morning and I came back in the morning. And my husband, thank God I was still married. Because when I came many times, he was asleep. When I left, he was asleep because 6 a.m., I'm gone. I had to get in office in order. That's the only time I could see my people from 6 to 9, you see? And so when you want to do well, no matter what good intentions you have, you will find them. They will chop you down in a heartbeat. That's just... That's just people. One of the uh, ongoing criticisms that uh, the public and even voters will have for government is a lack of transparency. Yeah. People say they never know what's going on or what's mm -hmm. happening with their money or how, mm -hmm. you know, how their money is being spent or what's happening. Do we need more, mm -hmm. more transparency in government? I think we have done much better now. We're trying to be as transparent as they can. But of course, you know, there are some people, no matter how transparent you are as your own, you still haven't done enough. You haven't, you, you, didn't, you didn't tell me about um, the, the thing that happened last week. And you told me about everything else and you left. <laughs> you know, so, so you have to know how to do it, when to do it, because there are some things that government cannot reveal at that time. Sure because they don't even know yet. They're just in the process of dealing with certain things. But the people want it now. T tell me now, well, why are they not telling me about it? You see? And leadership, Jerome, is not easy. Mm. It's not easy. And your intention, it might be good, but I'd say like one of my friends said that she was not feeling well, a former member of parliament. And um, this lady came to her and she said, um, you know, how you doing? And she could see she wasn't, feeling well. She said, well, I'm not doing too good today. You know, she said, I'm going to the doctor. And so the lady said, oh, well, um, I don't blame you. Say, as soon as you finish dealing with me, go to the doctor. But deal with me first. My, you, you are my situation <laughs> is more important than your health. Than your health. You see what I'm saying? Wow. So these are the things that you have to deal with because, in other words, you're not thinking about me as a human being that I have hurts and pains and aches. All you want me to do is to fix your case now. And now. <laughs> yes. What are some of the things that you're most proud of uh, during your time in government? I think, Jerome, um, I could say a number of things. Um, one, one of them is the fact that the many students God allowed me to assist are doing well and are building this nation. And I think that's one of the main things that I'd always be proud of because it would have been worth the effort. Because I often think, Jerome, about the many hours on I-95, going with the bus full of people's children and um, parents who weren't able to go because they had no money. And here I am 
heading, driving these buses. From Miami? From Miami to, to North Carolina. Raleigh, 13 mm-hmm. hours, one way, mm-hmm. one way. And so God allowed me to do that, but these children, these students did not fail you. They came back and they've done well. As a country, what do you think that we have done really well in, in our 50 years of, of independence? I think we've given more opportunities to Bahamians, and that's what I'm proud of. You could see more young entrepreneurs come on stream who own their own businesses and who now has hope. And then, of course, they've put in place now some funding for mm-hmm. them so that they're able to get jump started. And, and, of course, one of the things that I was always troubled by, Jerome, and I feel really good about that, is agriculture. Because I was one of those who criticized agriculture when I was in Parliament because I didn't think we were serious at all. And um, now to see our schools, some of the churches, everybody, the government has gotten involved in agriculture and they've put more funding into it. I agree with you it. on that. I'm very impressed you know, by some of the moves I see happening. Yes, yes, there's well. no question about it. And so I thank God for that because, Jerome, you know, one of the things I talked about before COVID came, and I said to the parliament at that time, I said, Do we realize that 97% of our food comes from North America? Are mm-hmm. we aware of that? I said, what if the boats and the planes stop coming? Mm-hmm. What would happen to us? I said that in 97. And when COVID came, you saw what happened? Reality. Every country is covering their own mm-hmm. skin. They're, they're not checking for mm-hmm. no other country. Mm-hmm. And so it all came about, and now agriculture has really risen to another yeah, level. You're, you're, you're really quite right. I'm, I'm very pleased and proud and watched with great interest. Yes. I'm very happy yes. uh, with that. Yes. Um, what would you like to see the Bahamas like in the next 50 years? If you had that ability to, to look down the road and to have your say, now, what would you like to see the Bahamas evolve to or into in the next 50 years? Or maybe continue with? I think, first of all, I, we would like to see crime at a zero, really. Um, but we really like to see as little crime as possible in our country, and that's the Bahamas we used to know back then. Um, I would also like to see the church, the church being more involved in decision making in the country. That's how it used to be. When back in the 60s, the 70s, particularly in the 70s, under Sir Linden's watch, Mm -hmm. the church had a lot to do with debates what they were going to debate in Parliament, they would all, always really? consult with the church, and the church would always have their input on different topics. And that, that it, it brought together the people, you understand, and also what it did. The church became an integral part of the decision-making in our nation, in our nation. And so I don't know what is happening right now, if that is in fact the case, but that's what I knew. That's when Ari Cooper and, and, and I'm Brown from Bethel Baptist and all of those were very vital to, to the development. And history of the records that. Yes, yes. 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 Definitely. Mother Pratt, um, you know, we could go on. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh we're on, not on. even. We a could talk and talk. No, yeah. But unfortunately, we are out of time. Okay. I want to. Firstly, thank you for coming on the show uh, as well, yes. um, uh, coming on again. Okay. And every time you come, we talk about so much, and I learn oh, yes. so much. And I'm always blessed by your yes. presence, and, and your life yes. is an inspiration. Thank and and, you, and thank you. Thank you know, you, um, the country thanks you for what thank you have you. done. I thank you for what you have yes. done in my yes. life. And yes. there are many others out there who are uh, so much better yes. for your hand in their lives. And so we thank you. You yes. certainly are a national treasure thank to you. us. And we wish you continued health. Yes, thank you. You look too. fantastic. Happy thank independence. You. Thank you, too. Thank you. <laughs> Happy independence to you, too. And I'm proud of you, Joan. Thank I'm you very you much. Too. Thank You've you done. so much. And that's going to do it, folks, for our 
uh, show tonight. Make sure and you join us next week as we continue with our discussion, 50 Years of Independence. Until then, I'm Jerome Sawyer.